everybody. Hello, hello, hello. We'll let everybody join. We'll give it a, a minuto here. Good to, good to see everybody. Hope all is well. Welcome, welcome. There we go. Starting to get some numbers in there. Let everybody in. Jeez, people are writing. I, I'm going to tell you right now. If you if you write more than uh, two things, I'm probably not going to be able to get to it because I, I just it's just me tonight. So uh, people are writing lots and lots of stuff, uh, <laughs> like like some some novels here, and there's just no way that I'm going to be able to get to all of them. If that's the case, but we will do all that we can. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to your Wednesday night webinar. I'm Dr. Patrick McGrath, Chief Clinical Officer at NoCD. At NoCD, we're an online platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder, body focused repetitive behaviors, hoarding and ticks. And we do exposure and response prevention therapy, as well as habit reversal therapy. And we take lots of insurances here throughout the United States and getting more and more all the time. And we also work with people in Canada and the United Kingdom and Australia as well. So um, let's see. We've got a lot of things. I'm going to go to BH. She says, your question would be, because you deal with in vivo exposures um, daily and use response prevention tools, is that okay to move towards recovery? It seems like they've helped so far. I love in vivo exposures uh, uh, and interoceptive exposures. I think that uh, those are great things. Um, you know, of course, you're always going to doubt if you're doing exposures enough or correctly. And that's going to just be part of OCD. But if you know that something is working and it's leading you toward what you feel is good recovery, I, I say you keep on going and you keep on doing those things. That's that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> Peter says he's grappling with hyper awareness OCD and he's overwhelmingly preoccupied with his thoughts. Um, struggling with that. So, uh, Peter, I'd wonder what, what are you getting out of monitoring your thoughts? You know, I, I would contend that no human being does anything without getting some kind of thing from it. Right. We would never do something that would be horrible for us that we felt was horrible. Uh, when we do things, we feel like they would be good for us to do in the moment. Even if we know in the long term they wouldn't be great for us, as long as in the moment it feels like it would be the best thing to do or the most relieving thing to do or would give us the, the most amount of gratitude maybe or something of that nature. Like people who abuse drugs very often can tell you that it's horrible to do. but not doing drugs is awful. Try talking to someone who's trying to quit smoking who says, I logically understand that smoking is probably the dumbest thing I could ever do in my life. It's the number one thing that I could do to make my health better would be to quit smoking. And yet, you know what? I keep smoking. You know why? Because every time I try to quit smoking, it feels awful and horrible. And I hate that feeling. And so I keep smoking. But maybe next time. And how many promises has someone who's quit smoking said, this will be my last cigarette ever, I promise. And then they have another one. So that's why when you're quitting drugs and alcohol, it takes usually several times before you finally get to, to something. So Peter, I'm wondering, what is the benefit that you're getting out of monitoring your thoughts? You will probably say nothing. I will challenge you. And then we will have some kind of discussion around the idea that you probably have this notion that if you aren't monitoring your thoughts and you have a thought that would be bad, um, then, and, and maybe, you know, you let it go or, or something like that, what would that mean? And so then we would have to do specific ERP to that. So there's not a lot that Peter wrote in here that I can kind of answer, but one of the things that I do notice is that when people are really observing all of their thoughts. They're trying to catch everything to make sure that they don't have any kind of bad thoughts they need to neutralize. And 
in and of itself, that becomes a compulsion to try to catch everything. And so we want to help people not do that and learn how to just allow thoughts to be there. Uh, we might even do like scripts or we might even record some thoughts as well. And then after recording them and um, having you listen to them over and over, you might start to habituate to them a little bit more as well. So. Uh, let's see, Miro, uh, there's a lot there, Miro. I'm going to have to try to see if I can just condense this. Uh, here, I'll come back to you a little bit. Howdy, Dr. McGrath from Snow Child. Any tips for the super happy fun times when magical thinking meets harm OCD? I.e., this thought of me hurting someone won't go away until I do it. Um, so Miro, or sorry, Snow Child, um, the thought of me punching myself in the face won't go away until I do it. So let's see if I punch myself in the face at some point in time during, during this, uh, this webinar. And now that I have the thought about punching myself in the face, Snow Child, how much should I focus on punching myself in the face? face? Will it be necessary for me to punch myself in the face in order for the thought to go away? Or do we want to bet by like tomorrow, I'll totally have forgotten about punching myself in the face, even though I won't have punched myself in the face as a way to deal with this thought about, I have to punch myself in the face. So here's, here's some super fun, magical thinking. The thought of me punching myself in the face won't go away until I do it. Let's see what happens. Now, what's the difference potentially between you and me, Snow Child? I don't have OCD, you do. But I'm going to use that to prove something. And here's what I'm going to use it to prove. If that thought made you do it, we would both do it. If that thought made you do it only if you had OCD, I'd be safe from the thought and you would be in danger of the thought. But then thoughts would have to know if you have OCD or not. And thoughts are not things that know things but don't know things. They are just things. So therefore, how dangerous is this thought? Or the other interpretation is, it is just a thought, but because you have OCD, it's telling you that it's dangerous even though there is no evidence of the fact of that whatsoever, but there is a what if that goes along with it, as in what if this doesn't go away until I actually do it, or what if I do it as a way to relieve this? And due to that, you're going to be very consumed by it, right? So let's see if I punch myself in the In fact, everybody listening tonight, I want you to think about punching yourself in the face. And let's see if it makes you do it. It doesn't have to be a punch. It could be a, a, a tickle your forehead, right? You can think about tickling your forehead. It'll be even nicer. And will that happen? Oh, but you'll say, oh, no, OCD doesn't care about things that are good or nice or fun or whatever. It only cares about the bad things. So, so I wouldn't care if I tickled my forehead. That really wouldn't bother me whatsoever. But if I did punch myself in the face, then I would care about that. That would be bad or awful or horrible. And so that I do have to worry about. Oh, so now OCD picks and chooses things and says, well, this isn't something you need to worry about, but this is. Hmm. That doesn't seem to make much sense either. But whoever said OCD made a lot of sense anyway. Uh, let's see. Terracotta Ciabatta says, when the urgency to feel just right annoyingly barges in, is that the moment to do self-talk to interfere with the compulsion, or can that become a compulsion? It, it could become a compulsion, and what I would love you to be able to do, Terracotta, is just to um, do something potentially just wrong, and that would be a fun ERP to do. So if the goal is to, hey, put these away just right, then put them away wrong and then walk away from them and allow it to be there and learn that you can absolutely handle it, right? But if your goal is to do something just right, here's what we know. Doing things just right 
is never going to actually work out because can anyone with OCD actually ever accomplish the just right thing? Maybe for a moment or two, but then OCD changes its mind and says, no, nope, you got to go back and try it again, or no, you got to go back and try it again, and you got to go back and try it again. So um, we're, we're not here to try to satisfy OCD by doing things absolutely the right way. We want to do this. We want to allow ourselves to learn that we can handle not doing things the right way, not doing things the way that OCD wants us to do, and that our life's actually going to be better when we do that instead of when we attempt to do things in exactly the way that OCD wants it to be done. Stephanie says she has a confession list. She can't seem to delete the list or be rid of it because she needs to refer to it to see if she needs to confess her memory to your partner. Um, you know, when, when we get into the idea that we have to confess things to our partners of all the things that we've ever done in our life, um, we really are putting our partners in a weird spot, right? I mean, I'm going to assume, and, and boy, you tell me what you all think, but I'm going to assume that most of you would actually not like to hear from your partner every single thing that they've ever done with anybody else or every single thing that they think that they might have done wrong. I'm just going to assume that. In fact, um, when I got married, you know, I, I was like, I, I just... I don't care who you dated. I don't care if you dated anyone else. I don't care if you were engaged ever or not. I, I, I just, I don't even want to know. Yeah. It is nothing to do with me. And uh, yeah. for me, it was just like, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, we're both virgins, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just how it's like, uh, you. If if you don't care about stuff in my past and I don't care about stuff in your past, why do we why do we need to even be worried about something like that? So th I say that to say that there is a possible way of doing that, that you don't actually have to do all this confessing. You don't have to tell everybody absolutely everything about your past and all of the stuff that you're afraid of and how you think you might be judged or evaluated in any way. Um, because it just uh in the end it's probably just feeding the OCD and it's not actually feeding the relationship. So you have to decide what you're going to feed. Are you going to feed the relationship or are you going to feed the OCD? And I beg you not to feed the OCD because uh, feeding the OCD is never a great idea. It just gets bigger and, and um, it just gets stronger and it just gets more omnipresent. And the last time I checked, that's really not what anybody wants, a bigger, stronger, more omnipresent OCD in their life. They, they, they'd rather have something far, far different than that, actually. A non-omnipresent OCD would be so much better in people's lives than, than an OCD that is overwhelming and taking over absolutely anything. Naja says, uh, why do the same themes have a different feeling each time they come? Well, it's kind of an OCD whack-a-mole kind of thing. You know, the same thing could could have a different feeling because uh, you you have the thing and then you have this feeling for it and you learn how to handle that. And then OCD says, oh, well, they learned how to handle that. Well, let's let it to feel this way. And now it feels like a whole new thing. And now you got to do it all over again. And then, okay, I learned how to deal with that. Okay, fine. Oh, shoot. Now it's now it's feeling this way. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. Now I got and, and you can approach every new feeling as it's an entirely new thing, or you could just approach every new thing like a feeling as that tricky OCD. Look what it's trying to do. It's trying to convince me like it's something new here, when the reality is it's not. It's not at all anything new. It's just the same thing in, in different clothes. That's all that it is. But it's always the same exact same thing. So do we really need to think about it as an entirely new thing, even because it feels a different way? Now, this is, of course, a phrase we hear all the time in OCD, right? Uh, why does it feel so real? Why does it feel so difficult? Uh, those kinds of things. And remember, just because you feel it doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's real, right? Now, I'm not saying that to deny that you feel it. I understand that you feel something, right? There's, there's no doubt about the fact that you feel something. But just because you feel something doesn't mean that something is actually dangerous. I've talked about this before. 
if you put on a virtual reality goggle and I have you in a large conference room and you walk all over the entire conference room and you realize it's all a cement floor. There are no trap doors or anything like that. There's no way for me to trick you in any way. And then I put a virtual reality helmet on you in the middle of the room and I turn on the program and it's a visual cliff. And if you take one step forward, it's going to look like you're going to fall off of the cliff. Even though you logically know that you are in a conference room that has a cement floor and there is no trap doors, you will not want to take a step forward because it will feel uncomfortable. Right? Your mind is interpreting it as dangerous because it sees a cliff in front of it, even though you logically know that there is no cliff in front of you, but it looks like there's a cliff in front of you and you will seriously think about if you're going to be doing this thing or not, if you're going to actually take this step or not. So. Keep that in mind, all right? Remember this. Just because we feel something, it doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's real. <laughs> Legendary says, how do you recover from depersonalization? Uh, one great way is to do interoceptive ERP, where you do exposure and response prevention therapy to sensations that trigger depersonalization or derealization. And you allow yourself to learn how to handle those triggers so that it doesn't lead eventually to depersonalization or derealization. We've had people do things like long-term hyperventilating or staring at a spot on a wall for a long time and their eyes cross and they kind of feel dissociated or derealized and, and everything like that. And over time, you learn that you can handle those things and that you don't need to be afraid of derealization and depersonalization. And that if you do have it happen, that you can handle it and that you don't have to worry about the after effects of it as well, too. So there's a lot of good work on that with interoceptive exposures. Matt B says, hey, do the no CD offer training courses for peer support? You've become so passionate about it with voluntary support groups and would love to pursue it as a career. Uh, we don't at the moment offer those kinds of courses, but I would check the International OCD Foundation to see if um, if you if you um, might be able to find a place there where there would be some training. HG says, hey, wasn't aware that you knew Dr. Ian Osborne. I do. Just received his new book in the mail and saw my review. Oh, oh wonderful that, that, that the book came out. That's great. I can't wait to I can't wait to see it myself. I hope it will it'll probably be in the mail when I get home, actually. So looking forward to seeing it. That would be wonderful. Yes, I got an advanced copy of it and got to read it. And uh, it was lovely and was happy to, to write a review for it. Uh, Hyper awareness of thoughts. Am I real? Is this really happening? You know, it's interesting. OCD, in certain instances, has you doubt your senses, right? Take for granted, for example, if you don't have OCD about driving, you probably. Even if you get to a place and think, my gosh, how did I even get here? I, I, mean, I barely even remember the ride. It was like autopilot. You probably don't think something horrible about it. But if you do have uh, OCD maybe around what if I were to harm uh, children, if you go to the mall and come home and then don't remember every single aspect of the entire experience of being at the mall, your default thought will probably be, hmm. I don't remember like two minutes at the mall. I wonder if I molested a child in that experience. And this is what happens, right? This is the way that it goes. This is what OCD does. It loves to find an area of doubt that you think you're vulnerable in and really, really exploit that experience. So um, if OCD can think of something bad that might have happened, well, then guess what? OCD is going to go right there and it's going to get you to think, you know, you probably did something, something really, really horrible, right? But do we know that for sure? No. Can we know that for sure? I'd say with pretty good relative certainty, I, I will not say absolute 100 percent but there's not a lot i would say i would know absolute 100 percent about 
And therefore, can we be okay with that or not? Now, the reason I say in that example, you can't know with absolute certainty 100% is that even if I took you to the mall, and I had an entire security footage of you the entire time you were there. And you can watch the entire two minutes of yourself at the mall. You would still in your head think, what if that was the last time I was here, though, instead of this time? And um, there was some time that it wasn't the front of me to see my face. It was the back. and and. And what if that was actually someone else who just happened to be wearing the same clothes or, or something like that? And I was I was off somewhere else, or something, right? That's why I say OCD won't allow for you to believe something in 100% certainty. Yeah. I've talked about scrupulosity and I've said your higher power themselves could show up in a video teletherapy session with you and me and they could say to you, okay, you, guess what? All's well. You're going to the afterlife that you want. Nothing to worry about. You've committed no sins. I know your future. You never will. And we will be together in eternity. And your first response will be, are you sure? So there's just no way to totally reassure a person with OCD to believe all of these things. And while I would love to be able to give an answer of absolute certainty to someone, I haven't figured out how to do that yet to the degree that OCD will say, oh yeah, cool, all right, we're good. Yeah, all's fine, wonderful. All right, there's one longer one. Uh, Miro comes in from Lebanon. Uh, let's see, I'm just gonna kind of, um, you know, contamination, OCD, you got the vaccine, the COVID, you started going out again, you stopped masks a few times, you used alcohol and sanitizer. Um, at work, they will ask you to start traveling again. Uh, you have an opportunity to visit someone, but you're freaking out. It's a 24-hour trip. You can't imagine yourself on a plane with so many people. Um, and... Even in your house, you don't touch things that your sister touched before. You have your own dish and things like that. How can you be at a friend's house or in a hotel? You need advice as possible. Do you think this is an experience that might help? You heard that in ERP, we need to go little by little, not start with big things. This is a big one. Do you think you should wait until you overcome other obsessions or a big exposure like this one can be helpful? Um, so obviously a tough question because, boy, you're offered this opportunity right now and you never know if you're going to have this opportunity again, right? So I would say, what can you do prior to the trip to really start working on this as quickly as possible? And how many little ERPs can you do? Like, can you share something uh, with, can you share something with your sister uh, and start to practice that so that you can start to prepare for being with your friend or being in a hotel or being on a plane with that many people. But but here's what I would ask. And and this might just be the, the easiest way that I can start this because you're, you're saying that it's so um, maybe quickly coming up. And I mean this in all love and all sincerity. And any of you who have ever worked with me or have heard me speak, you know probably what I'm going to talk about. Mira, I'm going to ask you, why are you special and why are the rules of the world applying to you differently? Why can all those other people fly on the plane without worries that you have? Why are all those other people in the hotel that you're in without the worries that you have? Why do other people go visit their friends without the worries you have? And the answer is very simple. Those people don't have OCD. So, Mira, you're looking at it as if the problem is the hotel and the plane and the sharing and being around people and all those things. And frankly, this is what everybody with OCD does. They tell me this is a problem and that's a problem and that and that's bad and this and that and that. And, and my answer is always the same to everybody. None of those things are problems because if those things were problems, everybody in the world would have a problem with them. How is it possible for uh, three people to experience an elevator? opening and one of them runs in and pushes all the buttons out of total excitement one of them walks in and just you know hits their button to their floor 
And one of them takes a step back and decides, no way, I'm not getting in there and takes the stairs. Three people just experienced the exact same thing, the elevator door opening, okay? They all experienced the exact same thing. Why is one person totally excited about it, one person absolutely indifferent to it, and one person 100% afraid of it? Well, many people would want to say, well, I blame the elevator. The elevator's not the problem. If the elevator was a problem, everybody would have been afraid of it. But if elevators are fun, everybody would have thought, well, it's a totally awesome elevator. We're all going to get on it. That's awesome. Elevators are totally neutral. Elevators are subject to the interpretation or perception of anybody experiencing them. The problem, therefore, is internal, not external. So Miro, you're looking at all of these things as being things that are going to be overwhelming and difficult and, and the hotel is hard and the plane's hard and the sharing's hard and the utensils are hard and, and all that kind of stuff. None of that's hard, of course, right? Absolutely none of that's difficult whatsoever, unless you think it is. And if you think it is, then it's amazingly difficult. You know why? Because of the way you perceive it. I contend all of those things are neutral. They're not easy. They're not hard. They're neutral. They're subject to the perception or interpretation of anybody experiencing them. So whatever you have OCD about, and there's someone else in the world that isn't bothered by it, the thing that you have OCD about is actually neutral and is subject to your perception and your interpretation. And OCD has a very, very great track record of only interpreting things in the worst, most awful, horrible way that it possibly can. You've never met anyone with OCD who said, you know what? I think it's going to be awesome. Hey, doctor, um, I'd like to see you for sessions. Okay, why? I'm afraid my life is awesome and everything's great. I'm, I'm just so afraid that I have such an awesome life and that everything is so wonderful uh, that, that I won't be able to handle it. That has never happened in my career. No one has ever come into my sessions telling me that that's what they're afraid of. And you know what? Nobody ever will because that's not what people are afraid of. Doesn't happen. People are afraid of their perceptions of neutral things. And OCD's perceptions are always the worst case scenario of neutral things. Now, you can argue with me till you're blue in the face. Well, this is actually really awful. And this is horrible. And this is, and I'll find someone else in the world who just doesn't care about it. Oh, but this would be awful. <laughs> this other person's like, I love that, actually. I think that's great. I'm really excited about that. So, I don't believe OCD at all when it tells me things are going to be awful and horrible and it's the worst case scenario. I just, I have zero faith in anything that OCD says. I find it to be an awful reporter of, of information. I find it to be a terribly awful uh, interpreter of events and situations. And I know one thing about OCD that it's amazingly predictable and that the only thing that it is going to tell me is the worst case scenario. Never once have I ever met an OCD that has told me anything but the absolute worst case scenario. Okay. So, you know, you can decide that OCD is a great reporter of truth to you. Or you can recognize OCD for what it is, that it's a big old liar, and that the last thing that you need to do is believe anything that it says. And that would be my hope in any of the work I do with people is to never believe OCD. I might sneeze. Hold on. No, okay. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> Watch in two minutes. I'm going to just sneeze out of them. Cause of the Kid says, any advice, words, on thought replacement OCD? If I see or hear a bad word, feeling paralyzed until is replaced by seeing or hearing a more positive one. That is a total safety behavior. Do not do that. Words cannot pause you unless you choose for them to do so. Right? So um, 
I'd be interested to know what kind of thoughts make you pause, uh, or what's a bad word or something like that. Uh, uh, I've never heard a word in my life that's caused me to have to pause until I've had a more positive one. And believe me, I've heard what thousands upon thousands of people have told me are the worst thoughts in the entire world because they've shared their OCD thoughts with me. Never once have I had to pause until I heard a more positive story. Could you imagine in the middle of a therapy session if told me somebody told me something that I agreed was the worst, most awful, horrible thing in the world, and I just did this? And I stayed there like that until someone showed up at my house and said, Patrick, people love you and you're awesome. Oh, whew, thank you. Oh, I was so frozen there. I, I spent I spent the last six hours sitting on Zoom, staring at myself frozen until somebody gave me a more positive thought. Only OCD tells you that, right? People without OCD don't do that. That's an OCD thing. So again, another great example of just the utter crap that OCD feeds you on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You know, Kaza, imagine going up to anyone else in your life and saying, you've got to wait for your life to be better. Anytime you think something negative, freeze until somebody says something positive to you and then continue on with your life. Tell you what, it works great. No, you would not give that advice to anybody else. All right, I'm going to have to sneeze for a second. I'm stopping the camera. I'll be right back. Okay, I'll bet. <laughs> no one needed to see me blow my nose. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's go back. Rosie says, thanks for putting all the good work. Appreciate it. Of course, Rosie. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Hollow says, if I have anxiety and I don't know why, I feel the need to figure out why or what made it happen. This is my awful worry last night. What can I do? I have had the same anxiety today as well. I appreciate it. Uh, and then the next one is how to stop ruminating. Boy, those go together nicely. Um, Hala, find me one person in the world who has OCD who said they finally figured out everything the way that OCD wanted them to figure it out, and then it went away. When you do that, come back and find me, which means Hala will never be back on this webinar ever again because Hala will spend the rest of their life trying to find somebody who that's happened to. It will never happen. You know why? Because that's not the way that it works. Okay? You're never going to figure it out to the satisfaction of OCD. OCD is unsatisfiable. So don't even try. It's a waste of time. MC12 says how to stop ruminating. Well, I'd love to say stop ruminating, but that would be like just saying stop it to anybody who's anxious. I'm going to go back to what we talked about earlier, MC, and if you didn't see at the beginning, go run this back again. First, I'd like to know what you're getting out of ruminating. You wouldn't be ruminating if you weren't getting something out of it, so I'd like to know what you're getting out of it. And you're going to say, I get nothing out of it, and I'm going to say, you're wrong, because no human being does any behavior without getting something out of it, even though we may not like it, we're still getting something out of it. So uh, what are you getting out of it? <laughs> becomes the most important question that you can ask in this situation. What are you getting out of it? And then when you figure that out, which could be you're trying to figure something out to the absolute answer, 100 degree, then we can start doing ERP and not being able to know everything, not having all the absolute answers, not having guarantees or something of that nature. Then you will start to feel better if that is the case. Andres says, how can you do ERP or deal with obsessions that are based around past things happening again if the same action is done? For example, going back to old hobbies, etc. Would scripting be the best method for it? Uh, with obsessions that are based around going back to past things. So I'm wondering if you mean here, if you do old hobbies, it triggers old obsessions. Um, I would say that's fine. You want to do that, actually, and then not do compulsions. So I don't know that you need to do scripting. I think that you need to do the old hobbies, have the obsessions, and and not do compulsions. You wouldn't need to do response prevention instead. That's where I would go with that, unless I'm reading that wrong, but that's how I would take it at the moment. Oh, we're halfway through. So a reminder, everybody, you're listening to the 
No CD Wednesday night webinar, uh, and No CD is a online platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder, body focused repetitive behaviors, and hoarding and ticks. And we do exposure and response prevention therapy, and we do habit reversal work, and we do cognitive behavioral therapy for hoarding. And we work in all sorts of places like Australia and Canada and the United Kingdom. And we take all sorts of insurances here in the U.S. And we take more and more all the time as well, too. So if you're looking out for treatment for any of these things, please check us out at nocd.com. You can get a free 15-minute call with one of our care team members. And we'll see if no CD therapy might be right for you. Uh, Nahan says, uh, I often struggle with the content from your OCD. It feels like you can do ERP easily with most compulsion, except for ones that have extreme dire consequences. What would have an extremely dire consequence? What obsession would have an extremely dire consequences? Name me one thought or image or urge that could actually bring about a dire consequence. That's what I would want to know. And then I'll tell you about kinds of, of or, or, uh, response prevention exercises that you can do. But Naman, I need to know what would be an obsession that would bring about extremely dire consequences because I've never heard of one. So if you can find one for me, that would be great. Now, I've had plenty of people tell me that they have them, but no one's ever showed me one that actually has brought about an extremely dire consequence. So I'd love to know if you have one, bring it here. Let's dissect it and let's see if it's actually true. CL says, thoughts on trying to conquer OCD with self-help, self-directed ERP. You know, there's a lot of great books out there that you can read and things like that. And, and I think that if it's a pretty mild case of OCD, you might be able to do a pretty good job with some of those types of things. But if it's more than an extremely mild case, I would say uh, the help of a therapist and a professional is really going to be uh, essential probably in these types of experiences. James McCoy says, I can't stop picking at my skin. What kind of treatment can help? So there we would do something called habit reversal training for something that you have called excoriation, which is skin picking. And that is something that we do at NoCD. So check us out at NoCD.com or TreatMyOCD.com. And let's see if we can do something now. Norma says, have you ever heard of someone with OCD like mine? Uh, I don't know what yours is yet, but we'll see. That isn't so much detailed thoughts, but thoughts that tell you your actions in the moment are or could be inappropriate. Uh, totally. Yes, all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, uh, remember, OCD is always what if, right? So what if you're doing something at the moment that would be inappropriate? What if this is bad? What if this is awful? It could be even a moral scrupulous kind of feeling as well, too. So yes, there's tons of what ifs that come along with OCD. So I have absolutely heard of that before here, and that is not a surprise in any way whatsoever. Chloe says, how do you differentiate between sexual orientation OCD and actually being a different orientation? You've ruminated so hard, it's no longer clear to me who I am. Well, this is when you reach out to a therapist, Chloe, because your ruminations, of course, have not helped you, and all they've done is confuse you more. That's what happens when you do compulsions. They don't actually help. They make things worse. Chloe, reach out to a therapist, and if you need us at NoCD, check out NoCD.com or TreatMyOCD.com. If we can't work for you, you can go to the International OCD Foundation as well and check out their their list as well too. Chloe, I would tell you, compulsions are not the way to solve this problem. Rumination is not the way. So that's what you're going to have to do. I would reach out for help. Wendy says, good evening. Is ignoring your intrusive thoughts the same as pushing them away? Do I have to acknowledge them? No, I would say, Wendy, that's great. You know, if they're there, you're like, oh, you, okay. And then you're just kind of moving on and, and everything like that. That's awesome, right? Here's the thing, Wendy, as long as you're not doing compulsions, then you're great. But if you have to do something to ignore them, you want to make sure that that's not a compulsion. So that's why I just kind of talked about acknowledging and moving on, because I, I just see that as, as there's no real compulsion there. It's just like, oh, having a thought or image here, okay, great. And then I'm moving on. Uh, that's good. Doing whatever I need to do in the moment uh, to get things done. Awesome, awesome. But if that works for you, fabulous, fantastic. Keep it up. GR says, we're just hurting our journey with your 12-year-old daughter's contamination, OCD. You're worried about how to get her to engage in her own treatment rather than simply avoiding the topic. You know, GR, it's very essential that any therapist that you're working with are going to include you in therapy. And they're really going to work on things like um, accommodation work, right? So GR, and, and I don't say this with any blame whatsoever because... 
families do what they feel is the best that they possibly can. But a lot of times families become a part of the OCD and are applying a lot of accommodation to people with obsessive compulsive disorder. So what we would want to do, GR, is we would want to work together with you on you decreasing the accommodations that you provide to your daughter and her OCD. And that might also be a motivator then for your daughter to get some help because as you remove the accommodations, things are probably going to get more uncomfortable for her. And as they do, she may you know, really lobby for you to keep back from doing those compulsions. And this is where you're going to have to stand really tough and say, nope, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. And hopefully that starts to motivate her for some therapy to start learning how to live in a life now where there are no more accommodations being provided to her OCD. So I think that that would be something that you need to do. Zach said, hey, started his own channel on anxiety and phobias. Oh, good for you, Zach. Wonderful. Uh, let's see. Sexual orientation, OCD doubts start when you wake up and end when you sleep. What should be done in this case? <laughs> well, then you reach out to a, a provider. And if it's in interfering that much in your life, you might even start with a higher level of care, like an intensive outpatient or a partial hospital program. If they're going like 12 hours a day and they're not stopping and it's really interfering in your life, then you might want to look at that too. So I would find yourself uh, a provider who could really help you uh, because not much I'm gonna tell you here to do in a one-on-one -on -one kind of basis. That's probably gonna be very helpful to that. You really do need to be under the guidance of a professional. Rosie says, can you please do more sessions on don't try hard or try different, especially in context of contamination OCD thing? You know what, Rosie? Yeah, maybe we'll do that. I'll, I, can don't, I can devote one of these uh, sessions uh, to, to don't try hard or try different. So thanks for bringing that up and I'll, I'll work on that. Roxanne says, is there ways to get certain accommodations for OCD? You feel like living alone is best for you, at least having a private bathroom, but it's incredibly hard to afford that with what I'm currently making. Uh, you know, you're right. It's going to feel best for you because OCD is going to tell you that that would be the best thing for you. But Rosie, there's, or, or, or Roxanne, sorry, there's plenty of people in the world who share bathrooms with multiple, multiple, multiple people. Uh, I went to college and we had like 60 people on my floor and we all shared a bathroom. Um, you can get through that. And so now what I would say, instead of uh, spending all this extra money to kind of give in to what the OCD tells you is right, you do ERP right now to start learning how to handle that so that you can deal with it and do it without that influencing you and getting in the way of your life. So you'll be far better off in the long term if you're doing ERP on these types of things than if you are going to seek more and more of those kinds of accommodations to satisfy what your OCD is telling you that you have to do. So that would be my suggestion. Uh, let's see. HD says, any chance I could pass along a thank you to Dr. Osborne? I'd be happy to. I'll email him. Sure. Uh, Amber says, OCD impacts your confidence in who you are, drive for certainty, trust in your actions, memories, anxiety, etc. Meds help anxiety, but the others still sucking. <laughs> Do aspects recover at different rates? Yes. Uh, you're, you're not going to see kind of everybody follow the same pattern, and you're not going to see all things change at the same time. Uh, there are some things that are easier to face or deal with than other things, and that's just going to be the way that it is. It's unfortunate, but it's true. I, I wish that we could give you a better pattern than that or give you some confidence to tell you this will happen on this date, and that will be then, and this will be this hard to deal with, and that'll be that easy to deal with, but that's just not the way that it works. So I wish you the best, Amber, but take the ride, right? Allow for the ride, and uh, it's not going to go exactly the way you want it to, but give it a go. Colin says, you feel like you're not able to accept your pedophilic OCD. You're constantly having the debate of whether or not you're a pedophile or a person with POCD. You understand OCD is the doubting disorder, but you're struggling. Uh, here, here's the problem with that, Colin. There's nothing else that I'm going to tell you that's going to convince you of something that you are or are not something, right? Uh, because OCD is the doubting disorder. And so, Colin, you're doing the classic problem here. You're searching for a guaranteed 100% certain answer when you have a disorder that won't ever accept a guaranteed 100% certain answer. So you're the rock in a hard place right now, and you're stuck. And and there's a part of your brain that says, but but I should be able to have that. I should be able to have that guarantee. I should absolutely have that. So I'll tell you what, uh, Colin, 
I have no guarantees about that in my own life as well, too, or anything of that nature about my future or whatever. Um, who knows, right? I don't think it's going to happen, but I can't all, I can't give you 100% guarantee that it never will either. And I can't give you 100% guarantee that I won't uh, murder someone, and I can't give you 100% guarantee that I won't some, run someone over with my car, and I can't give you 100% guarantee uh, that I'll even have a job next week, right? Um, I have no 100% guarantees for things. Uh, and OCD says, well, it's fine for all of those things, but I have to, in this instance, this is the thing that I must, absolutely must have 100% guarantee. And Colin, that's never going to happen. So you can debate for the rest of your life, Colin, or you can just recognize that just because you have an intrusive thought, image, or urge doesn't mean that you have to pay any attention to it whatsoever, that you have to believe it for anything, and that is the harbinger of anything at all whatsoever. If you remember at the beginning of this, I talked about the fact that I could punch my face by the end of this. Um, I've got 14 minutes left to go to see if I punch my face. And if any of you watched the last several of these, you know that I've done things like I said there's a possibility that I could burn my neighbor's house down and shoot some geese and all sorts of things. And um, those possibilities still exist, actually. So um, possibility does not equal probability. Just because something is possible does not mean it is highly probable. And OCD makes a lot of logic mistakes. And then, unfortunately, we fall for those logic mistakes. We believe them to be true. We believe them to be real. And we trust what OCD says instead of our own senses and our friends and our family and logic and all those kinds of things. Somehow, OCD has become the arbiter of truth. So something for all of you to listen to, to really ponder for a moment. Everybody pay attention just for a second. Why is OCD your source of truth? What has led you to believe that the only thing that has the right answers is OCD? And then you might say, well, I don't know that OCD has the right answers, but it has a lot of what ifs. Okay, fine. And I'll go down that route with you. Just because there is a what if, why? does that mean that has to be the thing that has to be paid attention to? Because I'm going to drive home tonight, and what if uh, my brakes go out, I lose control, I hit a school bus full of kids coming back from a camp, and I knock the kids into a river, and they all drown? Should I check my brakes? go to a uh, oil change place or mechanic shop and have them look at the brakes, have them give me a hundred percent guarantee that the brakes are okay. And then should I drive the entire way home, checking the brakes every minute on the highway just to be sure that my car will stop? Because I'll tell you what, the idea of killing 70 children in a school bus by drowning them in a river because my brakes went out is a pretty terrible thought. So Colin, how much should time and effort should I spend on my brakes tonight before I drive home? 20 minutes? Three hours? Stay up all night constantly checking them just to make sure. Doubting every time that I do check them because the more we check, the more we doubt. So getting more and more doubt over the course of the night and getting to a point where I just say, screw it, I'm not even going to leave here anymore and I'm never going to drive out of here. I'm going to stay here forever because I can't because what if? Or do I take a chance? I want to go down to the bottom. I'm going to scroll down here. See what all of you are talking about. And here's what I want you to do. I would like you to type in here, what is it that you want to do this week that OCD doesn't want you to do? Let's, let's put it out there. Let's see what everybody says. And let's kind of support everybody in this. What are you going to do this week that your OCD does not want you to do? We got a babysitter, a be happy, a go outside, go visit someone. 
What else? Let's see more. Go to work. All right. Come on, people. What do we got? Accept a job interview. Awesome. What else are you going to do? What are you going to do this week that goes against what your OCD wants you to do? There's got to be more. Go to work every day. Thank you, Laura. Have a carefree day. Awesome, Justin. Make some friends. Awesome. Go visit your sister and stay for a few days. Go back to work. Enjoy wedding planning. Go to work. Finish your to-do list. Hang out with your baby without needing to be constantly uh, to be on the move, okay? Sleep through the night. You have your first therapy session, Ralph. Sweet. Go shopping. Not count items on the fridge shelf to avoid the number 13. Leave your bed. This is great, everybody. Go to an art exhibit by yourself and be around people. Now, every one of you, take a look at what everybody else wrote. And I'm going to bet there's a common theme for all of you, which is going to be, A, I'm proud of you. but And then there's going to be a part of you that's probably thinking, but B, that's not really that hard. But mine's really hard. But those aren't really hard. And I say that because every time that I ever ran an OCD group at the hospital, anytime anybody new came in and people started talking about all of their stuff, the new person would always lean over to the person next to them and go, God, I wish I had that kind of OCD. That'd be really easy. Well, no. Everybody's OCD is the hardest one in the world, according to them. And everyone else's OCD, according to everyone with OCD, wouldn't really be much of a problem. And they wish sometimes that they could have that type of OCD instead. Well, if you're wishing you had another type of OCD, you're recognizing that that thing isn't a problem for you. So it wouldn't even be OCD at that point. You'd just be like, that? Oh, okay. Yeah, whatever. I hope all of you follow through. Right? And Cassie just said there, I have a habit of looking at other people and say, they're not going through what I am. Right? You're right, Cassie. They're not. And you know what, Cassie? They might be looking at you and say, you know what? She's not going through what I'm going through. There was one day at the hospital where four people came up to me at some point during the day and, and said to me, you know, Dr. McGrath, I probably have the worst case of OCD you've ever seen in your entire career. And the first time it happened, I was like, eh, you know, typical, I hear this a lot. Second time I thought, well, that's a coincidence. Third time I thought, all right, this is weird. And the fourth time I figured someone's punking me, right? That this is happening. I called all those people instead of going to our checkout group that we had, I called all of them into a room at the end of the day. And I said, okay, none of you are leaving this room until you all agree which one of you actually has the worst case of OCD I've ever seen in my entire career. And I had nothing else going on that night. So I just sat back and I listened to these people argue and they all stuck around for a while, even past the program time. And after an hour, hour and 20 minutes, they all were kind of like, you know, we're not probably going to convince anyone else of the fact that our OCD is the worst OCD ever, are we? And everyone else looked at each other and went, I mean, you're not going to convince mine. Mine's worse. You know, you know no, my, mine's the worst. Well, I mean, mine's the worst. And we kind of recognized, okay, well. We could spend a lot of time here wasted trying to convince ourselves that our, our OCD is so bad and awful and horrible that there's no way we can ever overcome it. And we can try to convince everybody else of that fact too so they won't even try to push us to try to overcome it because they'll be like, oh yeah, that's so bad. There's just nothing that anybody could ever do for something like that. Or... We can recognize, well, this isn't doing a darn thing for us whatsoever. Why are we wasting all this time trying to figure this out? 
about who has the worst case of OCD in the world? That's just dumb. That ain't going to do anything for us. And instead, let's recognize that the best thing that we could possibly do is to challenge our OCD by doing exposure and response prevention therapy instead of wasting time trying to convince ourselves that we're unhelpable because there's so many people that hold on to that belief that everyone else can get help because of me. So this is where OCD is very isolating and says to you again, you're special. The rules of the world apply to you differently than everyone else. No one else has OCD as bad as you. Everyone else can get help with OCD but you. You all have thought that probably at some point in time. Cassie says me every day. <laughs> so OCD isn't just the intrusive thoughts and images and urges that you have that you have to do compulsions about. It's the beliefs that you hold about it as well, too. They keep you stuck and down and not living the life that you want to live. And my goal for all of you is that you live the lives that you want to live and not the lives that your OCD wants you to live. Because the OCD life sucks. And I know that none of you want to live that life anymore. So all of you have one thing to do. And that is, A, follow through on the stuff that you said you were going to do this week. I'll say there's more than one thing. But B, what I really want you to do is this. I want you to work on recognizing OCD does not have your best interest at heart. OCD wants to keep you down. OCD wants to keep you stuck. OCD will never do anything for you that is helpful in any way. And that's just the truth. That's just the way that it is. OCD will not be helpful to you at all. So if you wouldn't go to a best friend who was having a rough day and say, hey, it seems to be a rough day for you. Have you tried a little OCD? Then you got to ask yourself, why do I keep feeding my OCD? <laughs> Amber says, I named my OCD after my friend's boyfriend because he's stupid and says dumb stuff. Yep. Well, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. I love it. I love it. All right, everyone. Still haven't punched myself in the face. No plans to either, even though the thought is still there. So guess what? Don't have to. Uh, don't have to give in. Don't have to give in at all. Anima said, thought about the, how do you cope with uh, do you, uh, the fear of planes and dying? Uh, Dave Carbonell has a great book on fear of flying. I would get a hold of that and I would read it. It's a wonderful book. And he even does some fear of flying workshops as well, too. So check out David Carbonell, C-R-B-O-N-E-L-L, -L, Carbonell. All right, everyone. Final reminder, if you're looking for help, no CDs here. Online platform for the treatment of OCD, hoarding. Related fears like uh, body focused repetitive behaviors and tics. We do ERP for OCD. We do CBT for hoarding. We do HRT for BFRVs and tics. We take insurance. We see people all over the world. Check us out at nocd.com or treatmyocd.com. And keep in mind, everyone <laughs> opinion on birds. <laughs> birds aren't real, Zorzad, just so you know. Birds aren't real. <laughs> And if anyone knows that, you'll love you'll love that reference. By the way, um, all the best. Take care of yourself. Be be a lot nicer to yourself than your OCD. Is. And uh, remember, we're going to come back next week, and I would like to hear the report of all the stuff that you did. Right, all the stuff that you did, not the geese. That's awesome. Uh, oh boy, birds aren't real. Is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. But. All right, everyone, be well. We'll see you in a week. Go kick OCD's ass. Talk to you later.